Hello, Monetization Nation. In this episode, I'm talking with James Clark, who is the managing partner of Clark Capital Partners. Early in his career, James founded and led an amazingly successful online retailer named Clearlink with more than 2,000 employees. He's earned some prestigious awards over the years. For example, the Utah State Bar named James as the Technology Partner of the Year, and Business Q Magazine named him as one of their 10 coolest entrepreneurs. People often talk about spirals that descend downwards, but we often forget the spirals can also go upwards. In today's episode, James Clark and I talk about some of the ways to propel our credibility into an upward spiral. Tectonic shifts are constantly transforming the earth and business, causing destruction and huge growth opportunities. I'm Nathan Gwilliam, the host of Monetization Nation, where we learn how to leverage business tectonic shifts to transform monetization. Do you have any stories of credibility where you've seen a company either gain or lose credibility for something they've done? You haven't lived until you've operated with or around a company that has done one of the two. And I'll probably focus on um, the, the uh, loss of credibility for a moment um, because it's one of those relationships. And as with all relationships, you come in with high hopes. This one is particularly challenging for me to even talk about because it was a, a dear friend of mine with whom I had grown up. Um, and you know, while we were in the midst of selling Clearlink, naturally all of the bulge bracket banks come out of the woodworks, the, uh, uh, out of the woodwork, you know, Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley and, and on and on and on that want to manage your assets. Um, at the same time, I had a, an old friend whom I had grown up with came to me and said, so I've got this great firm. We're managing about a half a billion dollars of assets. And, uh, I think you got to park your assets with me. Um, I was shopping and the, the offer, you know, different firms and his offer to me was very, very different than what anybody else had said uh, or had to offer really, because anybody can manage assets and they all promise great returns and so forth. But his was different. He knew that I was interested in alternatives. I'd been, you know, investing in uh, private deals for several years. And then I was going to open up my own shop focused on growth equity. So his promise was we're going to take 10% of our assets under management, and we were going to redirect them through you to manage this fund of alternatives. I thought that was really appealing. Nobody else was offering that, certainly not at Goldman Sachs or these other groups. And so it was really interesting to marry and match my capital alongside of the dollars of, of his organization at the time, which you know I thought was a brilliant idea. And apparently some of his clients did as well. And But when it came down to it, and while I was allocating real checks to these early companies with which we'd invested, in which we'd invested, um, it, it just never allocated. It just never came to pass. Uh, and, and going a step further, he was managing our own assets. And, you know, the first time we got a, you know, sort of a statement, you know, in a bull market where it's going crazy, our portfolio was down. And I thought, okay, well, that's, you know, news to me. However, you know, things happen and maybe he's in an interesting asset class. In addition to that, the next statement I got was when I was billed for the fees, I was billed for the equivalent of five years worth of fees in one single quarter. Oh my something goodness. was wrong. Something was wrong. So six months into this, I knew that something was wrong. I didn't know what. And so I immediately brought it to his attention. He humbly apologized and said he would take care of it and did for the most part. And uh, to what I thought was, was completely um, re recovered and, and brought back into my account. Soon I learned that the same thing had happened to others that I had brought in through his doors. Um, a brother of mine, a, a friend of mine from my hometown played major league baseball and, and another uh, dear friend of a, a publicly traded company that had all allocated resources there and were suddenly finding that they were overbilled you know, in this fee structure. And it wasn't small. It was never small. It was not, you know, a few thousand dollars. It was hundreds of thousands of dollars. And I knew something was wrong, but it was, uh, I, I thought it was just out of friendship or simply out of incompetence. And so, you know, that, that relationship ended before it really began. They never allocated to us. We never formalized a partnership. And, you know, you fast forward from that time, that was the beginning of 2011 to today, that, 
individual has now been sentenced and is, is headed to federal prison. On your resume, on your LinkedIn page, it talks about a degree from Harvard, um, an OPM degree. Yeah. Um, tell me a little bit more about that degree really quick. Well, you know, they'll never minimize the Harvard MBA as the inventors of the MBA and have an executive program, mm -hmm. uh, MBA available. So I did the next best thing. So it's not a degree granting program that I did there, although I spent two years there and built some of the best relationships I've ever wow. built in my life. Um, but it was, it's called the owner and president marketing or, or management um, program. Okay. Let's see. Owner, Yes. So, sorry, I think I just butchered that, forgive me. <laughs> um, but it's, you know, I had a cohort of about 120 of the 120, probably six or seven at the time were billionaires in their own right. So great business leaders that I learned a lot from, just as much as I learned from the great professors. That was a wonderful opportunity for me. My first, you know, I didn't do business school, you know, when I went to BYU and when I was at Rick's College, I didn't geography. study business. It was geography, exactly. Yeah. Um, so it was my, you know, I, I knew that I needed to know more. I, you know, and so this was my first experience and real exposure to great business professionals. And then if, if you look at that cohort, several others have now gone on to build billion dollar and multi-billion dollar businesses. So it was a great cohort to be a part of. My business partner today, James Harrison, that I just referenced was part of that program. And it was wonderful. But because they didn't grant a master's degree, I thought I'd better do a little bit more. And uh, so as soon as I knew that we were selling ClearLink, it was time to go back to business school again. And is that when you did Oxford? That's when I went to Oxford. Okay. The reason I ask about Harvard is that was kind of always my dream was Harvard. Oh. I interviewed undergraduate and I interviewed for my MBA and I got yeah. interviews. That's um, a big deal. But I didn't, I was not one that was accepted. So. Uh, well, listen, it's, it's a great place to be and there's, there's still opportunities there. Not that you need them, but it's a great yeah. one. So, so let's talk about the credibility right, real quick. Why, why do you think Harvard has so much credibility as an institution? And why does a Harvard degree have so much credibility for people that hold it? Um, well, you've, just, you've touched on it as you talk about the rigor to get through these interviews and the process and the scoring and, and all of those kinds of things. So rigor, I think, in its, in its own silo is one part of that. You know, just, I, I know that um, it, it's one of the first things that people want to talk about. You know, the old adage, how do you know a guy went to Harvard or Oxford? Um, because they'll tell you, right? <laughs> people are not shy about sharing that because they, they look for that instant credibility that comes along with it. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I know a lot of guys that have worked at great firms and immediately they'll talk about having been X at whatever firm because they want to lend credibility to their name and their career. And, and really, I learned far more at Harvard than I did at Oxford, but I needed that credibility that came along with the degree, having a master's degree, um, you yeah. know, and, and having gone to graduate school, but I, I truly did learn far more in, in the program at Harvard as it was designed. It was the same sort of syllabus designed for the, the traditional MBA students that we went through, but, you know, it was not a degree granting program. So that's, that is exactly why I went through for, you know, on the Oxford side. Um, and, and naturally is, you know, two of the, I would say two of the greatest universities on the planet, there's some credibility that comes along with that because of their rigor and, and, and what they're teaching is probably secondary. I think you can learn a lot more perhaps by spending two years in a, in a library, focusing on one or two or three different things in whatever your, your focus is. But, but we believe in education as a family. I believe that in it as a businessman is what I, where I spend a lot of my time philanthropically. All right, thank you very much. Uh, so you, you touched on something just now where um, your partner, what, what's his first name again? His name's James also. I, I actually have my only two partners in our firm are both called James. Okay. And none of us were Jimmy's or Jim's or Jimmer's, you know, we were all James's. So that's how we, it's kind of first and last name, you know? Yeah. So when I forget my daughter's names, when I look at them in their face and call them their other daughter's name, if I would have just named them all the same, then I'd never <laughs> heard of their name, right? Yep, call you and George Foreman. Yeah, that's yeah. the way to do it. <laughs> all right, so that works in your firm. That works, I guess. All right, so 
there's a concept in this book and it's the ascending credibility spiral. Mm. And basically um, I've seen it in several different situations, but, but they describe it. You described a situation where um, you, you had a small situation without, that wasn't really high stakes, like a paper being due, a project being due. Mm. And we're in this relationship with James Harrison and he, he, did it. He, he did what he said he was going to do and he proved he was credible. So like the spiral started here and it always starts with someone saying, proving that their credibility, credibility has to be first. Right. Yeah. And then as a result of that, you trusted him to do more things. You maybe chose sure. to be in different groups with him or different projects with him, or you chose Absolutely. to hire him or be a partner with him. And, and then he was successful in that and did what he said he was going to do. And the credibility grew. And it's like this spiral that grows up where you get, um, you, you get to a high enough level in that, that credibility spiral, mm -hmm. that ascending spiral that yeah. you, you trust anything, right? You, you trust that that person is going to do whatever they say they're going to. There is implicit trust there. I mean, just to everything that he does. And I got to watch that as a classmate. I also got to watch what he did in his business. He essentially created the insurance and the insurance comparison um, industry throughout Europe and did that online and was one of the early pioneers there. So to watch what he did there and with his own teams and then what we did together as classmates, you know, that we spiraled just as you had mentioned. And that's, it's fun to hear about an upward spiral rather than a downward spiral. Yeah. Really Usually when people talk about spirals, it's the descending. No, spiral. that's right. That's right. But I'll, but but I'll also say I have, I have a great mentor and friend and he manages uh, about $9 billion of assets built has came from a great bulge bracket bank and, and built out wonderful relationships is a bit of a legend in his field. But he says that people will invest with you for three reasons in this order. They like you, they trust you, and then you're going to make money for them. Isn't that interesting? That it's these first two in that order. They, they happen to like you. They trust you. And then it's about the money. Then it's about those other things. And I think that's really true. And we've seen that over and over that you know, we like people, we want to work with them. We trust them, we want to work with them. And then that last part is about the nuts and bolts of what we do as a business. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. And there's a lecture series named after him at a great university. It's the Reed and Christine Halliday uh, lecture series. This is a great guy. Very cool. Yeah, and even that last one. So, so two of those three points are very obviously credibility. You know, the, that I trust you, that's an element of credibility. And that you're going to make me money. Well, that's I trust. Or I, mm -hmm. I trust your credibility to be able to execute this plan that yeah. you're going to make me money. That first one, I like you. Um, do you think there's a component in, I like you, like we like to do, we do business and buy from the people we like. And I know that's true, mm -hmm. but do we, how are likability and credibility connected if at all? Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll say this. There are a lot of people that I really, really like that I would never do business with that I, that I simply don't trust, but I like them. I can socially be around them. You know, there's usually a fuse, you know, about a, an hour that I could spend. And I really happen to like that person. I've had roommates like that. I've had people that I've been in business with or business partners that I really, really like. but would I choose to do business with them again out of trust? No. So it, they've got to go hand in hand. So it's, it's never singular one or the other. Yeah, I can trust somebody, but I also think I need to like them. To, to make that a real meaningful relationship. So, yeah, I, I think it's one of those in, in, you know, in the three that you sort of tick that box. I like you enough to work with you. Yep. That's great. Um, and then of course, trust is going to be core. It's right there. And in the it's trust like ethics that they, that yeah. they're going to be ethical and do what they say they're going to do. That's right. And you know, I, I, the, the phrase that just drives me crazy is when people say, well, let me be honest with you. It's, and I respond saying, well, I hope you're always honest. That's right. Right? So if we're talking about these kinds of things, but it only matters when it's hard, to be honest. Right? It only matters when it's really challenging. Anybody can be honest um, when it's simple and easy, but when it's challenging, when you could lose the deal, when you could lose the whole company, um, when you lose millions of dollars. And I've been there. I've had to write checks for millions of dollars, literally, because someone in my organization made a mistake. And because my name is on the door, 
I take responsibility personally for that and write the checks for millions of dollars. Do I like doing that? Heavens no. But do I do it? Yes, because first and foremost, we're about doing what we say we'll do. Right. Okay, the next concept I want to talk to you sure. about is, uh, is love. Oh. Uh, there's a couple of concepts in love that build credibility. For example, um, we don't care what someone has to say until we know that they care, right? When we feel, in, in fact, this plays into the spiral too. When someone really loves us, um, we are open to them giving us good advice and we will apply the advice more. And, and then when the advice works in our life, they yeah. have more credibility and we listen to their advice more. It's, that's another thing that helps that credibility spiral ascend. But, it, but again, that's got to start with love. We've got to feel like somebody really cares about us or we won't, we won't listen. We won't trust what they're telling us. Yeah, that's, I love that. I love that you're talking about this. Where else do you talk about that in business? Not very often. Yeah. But I, I will tell you what we say about that in our firm. And I've hired thousands of people. We have about 35,000 um, employees in our portfolio companies today. And I have watched this theme play out over and over and over in hiring people that the reason that it doesn't generally work out with people that come into an organization, always with high hopes of someone that's going to, you know, do well and, and support an organization and do great in their respective sphere. It doesn't work out for two primary reasons, I would say. The first, that they just don't get it. They don't have the mental capacity. They don't have, you know, what it really takes to understand that, which is really rare when you think about it. Someone who went to, you know, accounting school gets how to be an accountant, right? So they know how to, you know, follow gap practices. You know, generally they'll have a CPA and we've been really rigorous in our hiring standards, so, but they don't get it. So that's one. The second one is far more common. And I think it, it dovetails into what you're talking about here is that they just don't care. They just don't care about their job. They don't care about the people with whom they're working. They don't care about the, what this is. Another way of saying that they just don't love what they're doing. And you can feel it in every part of what they're involved. Every part of what they do, you can tell that they just don't really care about it or the people around them or what whatever the thing of the day is. And that's what I find to be more common amidst people that just don't work out in organizations. I love it. Um, another angle of love as well is, is finding what our customers love mm. and connecting with them through those things that they love. It's that passion-driven concept I was telling you about. Yeah. Yeah. Um, have you seen, like Pet IQ, for example, yeah. those customers have a high level of passion or a high level of love for their pets. And I'm guessing that as you market, you market through that passion. Instead of saying, you know, I've, I've got a pet bowl and it's, eight inches across and it's four inches deep and it, yeah. it holds a liter of water. Instead, yeah. you, you say, you know, this, you mark it through how they feel that's right. about pet. That, that's exactly right. And that, that we're no longer pet owners, we're pet parents. That's about love. And that's, that's been, you know, something that we've talked about from day one in this organization is talking about how one is a pet parent and taking care of these, um, almost like, these, these animals, just like children. I mean, my feet are being warmed right now by my 60 pound dog right now, uh, Samoa. So he's right. And I am truly a pet parent. I have three human children and I have one pet animal here that I, that I pet child that I love very, very much. So that's, you know, how we do that in that organization. I think we've done that in other organizations as well, where, whether it's been about healthcare and loving the people that we're serving. I mean, I can't imagine anything more noble than trying to save people's lives. And so when we talked about cures and helping cure disease, highly infectious disease, that's really, really interesting for us. And that's driven out of love. Um, you know, I asked the question when I was doing my dissertation at Oxford, I interviewed 17 very highly successful individuals that had either built or managed billion dollar organizations. In fact, those 17 managed uh, almost a half trillion dollars worth of assets in their career. So it's a pretty amazing sample size, but I asked them this question, do you love to win or do you hate to lose? And naturally, and, and I, one of those was a hall of fame um, quarterback, you know, won a Super Bowl or two. And he says, of course, I love to win. 
20 minutes later into the interview, that same person says, Jason, I just got to go back to that initial question that you asked me about loving to win or hate, hating to lose. And you said, ah, I really just hate to lose. <laughs> and and there's, it turns out that there's a real power in that in high-performing operators. But loving to win is, is meaningful. And loving what you're doing is, is also meaningful. It's not bad. It's got a whole different component to it. Sometimes love is enough. Hating to lose, you will not let something go over the cliff and stay at the bottom of a cliff, right? Yeah. You'll resurrect that just as we've done. And I think, you know, that's how my love is manifest is that, you know, I just happen to hate to lose <laughs> a lot of what I do along with a lot of my contemporaries. Interesting. Okay. Last question for you. Yep. Who is the most credible person for you in your life and why? Well, this is a business theme. So, you know, and you're, you're asking me cold on, on this. Um, I was a have not amongst haves growing up, you know, very middle-class upbringing. I talked to you about working for my dad in his yard and in our home I, for, for both my parents and working on farms there. And now what is your, your town of choice in Rexburg, Idaho. And, and I, but I watched an aunt for me who kind of had a very similar upbringing. She had built out a business that you probably don't know of today. It was called Diet Center, but it was, it was global and it was meaningful. And I watched her as someone that was very, very generous. Every time there was a dance to be had at my school, hey, James, would you like to take one of my very, very nice cars to this dance? What are you doing this week? She would ask me, I'd say, anything you want me to be doing. And she would have me meet her pilot of her helicopter and fly up to her her cabin up in Island Park. And it was just one of those idyllic childhoods to watch this person who had so much, while we did not, to watch her, how generous she was. She was such an incredible example. She and her husband, um, Roger and Sybil Ferguson, were such incredible examples to me of those who led with love, who were authentic and truly credible in all that they did. And because they, they put their money where their mouth was, they got behind different causes and they really helped build up a community. It was either the university or farmers or this business at the time that were the greatest employers of, of Rexburg, Idaho. And so to watch her and what she did and this, this uncle of mine was just a brilliant, brilliant thing for me to watch that really launched my career. If she could do it, I thought I could too. And so it lent that credibility to somebody who came from nothing, that they can build into something. So the best part of growing up there was that my last name wasn't her last name because it would have been equivalent to having some very, very famous name of some very wealthy people. And, you know, to me, it was always got that little, you know, that, that little chip on my shoulder of sorts to try to prove myself. And I think that's why we continue to do what we're doing today. But that's now done out of love. And I'm grateful for one of, you know, a loving individual and someone who is, highly respected and had that credibility to watch and, and, and pattern my career after. So let me restate and see if I understand. You're saying that the reason she was most credible for you is number one, that she was so successful. Um, she'd been there and done that. And number two, that she was so generous with you. Yeah. And number three, that she was so kind to you. She was Absolutely. Well said. Far better than what I had said. And even the generosity extended more than just to me personally. It was, you know, I was a, a, a student leader at my high school and junior high, and she would call up and say, what can we do to help the school? The, the football field there is still called Ferguson Field, and I know they've now built a new stadium. And but it was, you know, can we put in a new sound system at the school? And, and she put me front and center, not she front and center, but me front and center. And that is that, that's some beautiful leadership and it taught me a lot about how to, you know, put others front and center rather than take credit as you're able. So yeah, she great, incredible. She did. Yeah. She did in every way. And, and I'll, I'll thank her forever. I wrote a, an article about her in that, in that upper Valley um, journal that used to be called the standard journal there about her mm -hmm. because she's just legendary in those parts and, and will forever be to me. Thank you so much, James, for sharing your stories and knowledge with us today. Here's some of my key takeaways from this episode. Number one, start growing our credibility spirals by doing what we say we're going to do and proving we can be trusted in low-stakes situations. 
then building towards being trusted in higher stake situations. Number two, be honest and quickly take responsibility when things go wrong. Number three, education can really boost our credibility. Consider getting more relevant education or training if we haven't already. Number four, share love to fully show people that we truly care about them and what they love to further build our credibility. Number five, go into fields we love to ensure that we care about what we're doing and increase our chances of success. Number six, use passion marketing to connect with the things our customers are most passionate about. Number seven, when we are successful, be generous with that success to help others. If you enjoyed this interview and want to connect with James or his business, you can find a link to his LinkedIn profile on the blog post for this episode. Did you like today's episode? Then please follow these channels to receive free digital monetization content. You can get a free monetization assessment of your business at monetizationnation.com forward slash assessment. You can also subscribe to the free monetization e-magazine at monetizationnation.com forward slash e-magazine. You can also subscribe to the Monetization Nation YouTube channel or podcast, or you can follow Monetization Nation on Instagram and Twitter. How have you seen others propel their credibility in an upward spiral? Please join our private Monetization Nation Facebook group and share your insights with other digital monetizers. Thanks for joining us for this episode. I hope you have a fabulous day. Do you want to become a better digital monetizer? To receive great monetization stories and secrets, please go to monetizationnation.com and join free. And if you liked today's episode, please subscribe to the show and share it.